Coming up, we look at the latest updates to software-defined storage with Storage Spaces Direct, new with Windows Server 2016, and the advantages in terms of cost, performance, and reliability. We also look at the deployment options from hyperconverge for branch offices to converge for enterprise-scale workloads. And keep watching as we'll also look at how this applies to disaster recovery. I'm joined by Eldon Christensen from our Software Defined Storage Group. Welcome. Thanks, Matt. Great to be here. Now, whenever we think about storage, one of the first things we think about is cost. So, what are you and the team doing to help address that? So, storage arrays have traditionally been very expensive. So, we wanted to try to give lower cost alternatives through software defined storage. We really started our software defined storage journey in 2012 and 2012 R2 um, with storage spaces. So if you kind of look at a traditional storage array, it's kind of this black box, right? And it's kind of this mysterious black box. But if you really peel that thing open and take a look inside, it's really some x86 PCs running software with an operating system. And you've got some connectivity. You've got some disks on the back end. Uh, and then you've got some sort of a front end on it that you connect to it. And that might be fiber channel. That might be uh, iSCSI. That might be fiber channel or Ethernet. So that ties it all together. So with, uh, with short spaces, what we've done is that we've really commoditized this and we've moved this software, which was in the controllers, kind of up into the Windows Server operating system. Uh, and then this really reduced the cost of storage. Uh, and then you can connect on the back end with SAS cables to like an external JBot enclosure. And then we use SMB3 as our protocol to connect to on the top. And then we can deliver you know, uh, local-like performance with SMB3. But there were still a few challenges here. You were limited to specific, more expensive dual port SAS hard drives and cabling and the enclosure. What we did is that with uh, Windows Server 2016, we've introduced Storage Spaces Direct. And with Storage Spaces Direct, what we've been able to do is completely remove all that external uh, SAS enclosure, those external drives. Uh, you had to have multi initiator capable drives you could have multiple machines connect to, and that whole SAS fabric. So we wanted to really uh, reduce all of those costs and move that up into the operating system. So can you take a look at how we provision Storage Spaces Direct? Yeah, sure. So let me uh, give you a little look on how this works here. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to create a uh, cluster. So I'm going to run the new cluster commandlet, and we're going to create ourselves a four-node cluster here. And you could do this through the GUI. You could also do this through the GUI as well. Right. Um, so now that I've got the cluster created, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to enable Storage Spaces Direct. So I've run the Enable Storage Spaces Direct commandlet, and what that's going to do is that's going to identify all the disks I have. I've got some, uh, some NVMe devices. I've got some SAS devices. It's going to identify all those. It's going to put them together into, a, uh, uh, into enclosures, and it's going to uh, identify them and set that all up for me under the covers. So now that I've got a virtual disk, what it's going to do now is that I need to create the, a volume. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to create an REFS volume on top of this. I've got a one terabyte disk, and so I'm going to actually allocate 900 gigs uh, to my capacity tier, right. and I'm going to allocate um, uh, 10 gigs to my, uh, 100 gigs, excuse me, to my um, performance tier. And so what that actually creates under the covers, now if I take a look at that, you'll see that I have a parity tier of 900 gigs, and I've got a mirror tier of 100 gigs. So can we have a look at this in Failover Cluster Manager? Yeah, sure. So let me show you. Now that we got it set up and running, let me show what we got here. So here's my four nodes. Uh, and here you can see I've got my four nodes here. So if I go and take a look at the pool, you're going to see I've got my NVMe de devices here. Mm -hmm. And then I've also got a set of uh, SAS SSDs. So this is an all-flash system. So it's right. really a, a very high-performance system here. But it could be SATA hard drives as it, well. It could be low-cost SATA drives as well. And then when I go and take a look at this, so here's my... Uh, disk, and you can see I've got a one uh, terabyte disk, and it just shows up in uh, under the C cluster storage namespace. So this looks like the exact same experience if you're using a traditional SAN today. You've been using the last couple of releases, so it's a very consistent experience with everything you're used to. There's so there's no big learning curve. Just those simple three command lists to set it up. Once I'm up and running, it's everything that you know I've been doing for the last couple of releases. Nice. So it's a very simple user experience. But is this converged architecture? Is this the only deployment option? No, so there's actually uh, two ways that you can deploy it. So we have the converged architecture, which we were talking about, and we can also do hyperconverged. So that's part of the kind of power and flexibility with Spaces Direct, is that we can actually can collapse that uh, compute and storage layer into one layer, and we can have now compute and storage running on the same set of nodes. So to clarify, each of these physical servers has Hyper-V and Spaces Direct configured on, this, on, on each server. Yep, that's correct. 
Okay, so now we understand a little bit more about the deployment options. How does all of this actually work? Um, so let's take a look under the cover. So um, if you were to go look, what we're actually creating under the covers is what I showed you is that we've actually got a set of NVMe devices. We've got some SAS hard drives. Um, and, and we're creating a capacity tier and a performance tier out of those. And then we're using that for caching. So what ha what's happening is that when hot blocks are actually written down to the storage array, those are actually be written to the SSDs or the NVMe to that caching tier. Um, and then as those cold as those blocks cool, then we actually move them down to the capacity devices. So that might be your, your SSDs, your, your spinning hard drives, your low-cost SATA devices. So it sounds like we're really using the hardware in an optimal way and to the best of its ability, but how is it all redundant and resilient? Um, sure, so let's talk about it. So I made that, if you remember a little earlier in my demo, I made that uh, one terabyte volume. So what's actually happening under the covers is we create that virtual disk, and then we actually carve that virtual disk up into 250 meg slabs. So then what we want to do is we want to take these 250 meg slabs and we want to spread them across different fault domains. So in this case, uh, in this scenario, um, a fault domain would be like a node. So we want to put each individual slab across a different node. So I will put, uh, so here's just an example of, I've got one slab of 256 megs and I spread that across three nodes and then, because I'm doing a three-way mirror. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I have another, the next slab of 256 megs and that might be spread across different nodes. But this could be two-way mirroring as well. It doesn't have to be three. It also could be two-way mirroring as well. Right, nice. So you mentioned mirroring and erasure coding, but how, how is that used? Um, yeah, so let, let me, actually, let me talk about erasure coding first. All right. Um, so uh, you can have a three-way mirror, and then we also do the same algorithm when we're going to go do uh, a parity. So a parity can be, uh, we'll actually spread it in those 256 meg slabs across the node. So in this example, I've got a four-way uh, node doing erasure coding, mm -hmm. so I'm getting, actually getting 50% efficiency. So in the last slide I was doing a three-way mirror, getting one-third efficiency. Here I'm doing erasure coding, I get 50% efficiency, and then that actually increases at scale. So if I were to add a fifth node to this cluster, now I'm now getting 60% efficiency because I've got four data slabs and I've got two parity slabs. Um, so let me talk a little bit about REFS and kind of how this all and, and how that works because I talked about a mirror tier and I talked about erasure coding and uh, how are we doing this. So what we're doing is that we uh, are using uh, mirrors to really optimize writes. So when we're going to do a write, we're actually going to perform those writes to the performance tier and we do that so we don't have to calculate parity uh, during the write. Um, and that really allows us to get really high performance writes. And then later, as data cools, we will actually move it from the performance tier down to the capacity tier. Right, so this is all within the REFS volume itself. Yeah, this is all within the REFS volume. So you get that one terabyte REFS volume, and then we're actually, we're always doing the writes directly to, the, to a mirror, and that way we can, don't have to calculate parity. And then as the data cools, we will then move it to the uh, capacity tier. Right. Now, one of the interesting things is that, um, and this really helps get us those IOPS, and by not having to pay that, the, the um, overhead of calculating parity. Now, reads, remember, can be, happen from both the capacity tier or the performance tier equally. So there's no overhead on a read. It's always just on the writes. With the writes, we're writing to the performance tier. We do it, with, uh, we do it to the mirror to get that offload, and then we can do reads from either side. Right. So what is performance really like? Can you give us an example? Um, yeah, so let's, uh, let's take a look at a system here. Um, so uh, here I've got a, a four-node hyperconverged system with four NVMe devices. Um, uh, I've got 20 virtual machines mm -hmm. running on each node in the, in the cluster. Um, I've got a, a, a load simulation tool that runs inside of them. Uh, I've also got a 100 gigabyte Ethernet connecting these nodes, so it's a, it's a pretty beefy system yeah, here, nice. so it's, good. It's, it's pretty fast. Uh, I've, it's four nodes and it's, hyper con and it's hyperconverged. Um, so what I'm going to do now is I'm just going to uh, I'm going to resume them. So I've got them paused. The the, the, the job load generator, the yeah. load generator paused. So mm -hmm. as you can see in the top, it's not generating any load. So I'm going to go ahead and fire this up. So that's going to kick off the load generator in each of those VMs. Yep. Right. So I'm kicking that off. So now if we look at the top in green, you'll see that we're pushing about 60 gigs per second. And that's so, gigabytes, yeah, not gig bits. Yeah, gigabytes per second. Right. So again, this is 20 nodes on, uh, with four, 20 VMs per node with four nodes. So this is 80 VMs uh, pushing against an NVMe device. So that's pretty incredible performance. That is incredible performance. But one thing that's important to a lot of our, our viewers is disaster recovery. So how, how does this fit with disaster recovery? Yeah, so, you, so with a hyperconverged solution, you normally get your servers in the same rack in the same system. 
Um, but if you were to have a, a loss of a data center, right, it's a, it's a great HA solution. It's resilient to a disk failure, it's resilient to a node failure, but what if you really want to be resilient to like a site failure? So you can actually take those nodes and you can stretch them across physical locations. Um, and you can actually get a disaster recovery and an HA solution all in one. So it actually, we use another new feature which is coming in Windows Server 2016 called uh, Storage Replica. And so, in, and we use fault domains uh, also here. So in this scenario, so we're slabbing that data across a site and then we're using Storage Replica to, to replicate that volume from one set of nodes to another set synchronously or asynchronously and we can have automatic failover across them. So a good example using synchronous rep might be site A, New York, site B, New Jersey, synchronous rep between them. Yep, exactly. Cool, so this sounds awesome, but how does somebody get started? What's a good way to get started? Yeah, so let me kind of show you some of the tools we have to help people get started with, uh, with, space, with uh, storage replica, excuse me. So we have this uh, nice uh, command that called test uh, SR topology, and what it does is it actually goes and looks at your system, and it will analyze it to see if there's any uh, any com for compatibility, it will look and go and, and conduct some performance tests. So it'll actually go and, and do some data replication between the nodes and actually see what does it look like. And then it'll tell you what your, your, um, what, how long that would your initial synchronization take. So depending on how big your volume is, how much data you got, and that establishes how long it's going to take to rep through that initial sync and get all that data pushed over. Um, while it's doing that, it'll give you some nice kind of a graph you'll see here of some performance metrics on what's going on in the background. Um, uh, it will also uh, give you information such as uh, you know, how big your log should be. Um, so if, if you're uh, conducting the data replication and you need to know how much data can I sustain before I have to do a full sync, it'll tell you that as well. So it'll give you some nice kind of way to prescriptively set mm -hmm. up your deployment. Awesome. So it looks like we've got some pretty cool stuff in Windows Server 2016 around software-defined storage, but where can people learn more? Um, go download the eval. Uh, there's several other hyperconverged solutions out on the market, and I think you'll be very surprised how we stack up. Great stuff. And of course, keep watching Microsoft Mechanics for the latest tech updates. Bye for now.